what you're going to be walking away with, first of all, are going to be real-world examples of why this title I gave it is not just curious, yeah, it is, but a significant risk. I'm telling you, uh, for the last several years, uh, I've, I've had like jaw-dropping amazement at things that get said and things that get done and not done. And I really felt it was important to uh, address uh, what I see as a, uh, an issue of uh, risk management concern. I hope you'll walk away with a high-level understanding of how risk probability really actually does work and how it can work for you or against you. But at least you'll know well, what's happening and why. I hope you will gain an appreciation of how to measure risk reliably using actual numbers instead of merely labels. I'm going to give you examples of how to see down the road and around the corners with respect to risk and probability. All right, now, uh, unlike most of the uh, presentations I make, this one is going to start uh, with maybe 20 minutes of anecdotes. And uh, I felt it was important to give these anecdotes, and some of them are personal anecdotes, uh, in order to, uh, in order to, uh, in order for you to connect and say, oh yeah, this happens to me all the time. These uh, anecdotes are going to include one from um, Agate Beach, Oregon. Uh, another, a uh, Santa Ana, California motel. Now, it's not the one you think. Uh, a 2006 Washington, D.C. flooding, uh, I want to say incident, but it was, it was uh, semi-catastrophic. Uh, last year's uh, northeastern U.S. flooding, where there were 200-year floods in the one year, and how citizens and news commentators employed the gambler's fallacy. And I'm going to give you a common example of an extremely unlikely event that occurs several times every week. Okay, first of all, Agate Beach, midwinter, midweek. Keep in mind, this is Oregon, midwinter, midweek. Yes, it looks pretty much like what you see here. Uh, drizzly rain, uh, temperature in the 40s. Um, my wife and I, who were at that time living in Portland, Oregon, decided for reasons that are irrelevant to this uh, anecdote, to go and spend a couple of days on the coast in the dreary gray. Uh, we were driving along the coast and uh, on a whim pulled into Agate Beach where you're, you're able to walk along and find these nice little agates among the pebbles of the beach. As we pulled in, we saw one, only one other car, which was surprising enough, in, in the parking area. What was even more surprising was it had Arizona plates. Now, we were recently from Arizona, and we certainly were surprised to see anybody from Arizona anywhere in Oregon in the midwinter. But that you had know, us May, we went down and we, we did our usual agate hunting thing, walking along uh, the beach parallel to the surf, the agates. And eventually there was another couple heading our way doing exactly the same thing we were doing. As uh, as we passed them, I wasn't looking at them we were looking for agates. One of them said, Riley Rice? And I thought, Wow. Somebody from Portland here turned around, and here's this, here was somebody that I knew from church experience in uh, Phoenix. Uh, had been in a youth group. I, I just couldn't believe it. What is what is Laurel and Paulus doing here? And she was with her boyfriend. And why are they? Anyway, we went out to Sandals for coffee. Yes, this was a long time ago. And uh, we were pretty much amazed by the extremely low probability that, for one thing, anybody would get Agate Beach in the winter, that two couples from Arizona, I living in Portland, they living in Phoenix, would encounter each other on the beach. And, in fact, it would have been easy enough to not even see each other. Well, of course, in those times, we attributed it to some sort of supernatural thing. Uh, but that wasn't the end. Later that year, we had moved back to Phoenix. And uh, I was in charge of a youth group, and I had a... Well, it was one of these many ideas in my 20s that sounded really good in my head and didn't work out really well. And the idea was I would take them on kind of a tour of some fun things to do in Southern California, 400 miles away from them. And I would drive them. They would be on the, the bus, and, and I would drive them during the night. It would take about a day's drive to get out there, or in this case, a night's drive. And then the adult sponsors would take them to Disneyland, and they'd spend the whole day at Disneyland while I would go to a motel and sleep. This is the first of that idea. We won't go into that yet. Most of you who have any kind of experience know that you don't just go to a night shift. But as it 
turned out, by about 11 o'clock in the morning, I realized I was not going to sleep. And so I decided to go for a walk. So I got up. I was at this little uh, travel lodge, inexpensive thing, right? And I'm walking along the sidewalk past the other doors of the motel heading for the street. And as I go by one door, which was open, and I'm just passing, and I hear a laugh, and I'm telling you, it sounded unmistakably familiar. I stopped, took two steps back, and peeked in, and there's there's my mother and stepfather, who live in Phoenix, 400 miles away, and they happen to be staying at that same motel. And I happen to walk by at the moment that uh, my stepfather laughed. And, uh, again, an amazing, extremely low probability event. How did this thing happen? Of course, it seemed to have no purpose, but there it was. Uh, it wasn't five minutes. Now, in June of 2006, it was not a, it was not a hurricane, but there was a very, very intense rainstorm that, uh, uh dumped a huge amount of water in Northern Virginia and the Washington DC metro area. I know that's because I was on a uh, vacation cruise up in Alaska and watched it on the news, and my home was uh, at that time flooded while I was gone. Uh, this flood, however, that's the end of the personal part of it so much, uh, put two main federal buildings uh, in deep trouble. One of them was the uh, National Archives. Fortunately, nothing uh, was lost. Uh, however, a more serious problem occurred at the IRS headquarters. Now, that actually was pertinent to me because I was at that time working full-time for the IRS as my client and was deeply involved in what was going on there. And what happened to the that huge building, which is almost visible in this picture at the top, was that the uh, the basement and the sub-basement flooded. you got to send us a great deal of water because they had about uh, 10 or 15-foot ceilings in this really, really old colonnaded building. And all of the parking, all of the um, electrical systems uh, were completely flooded, and... It took a long time to pump out. Well, the entire building, it being June in the southeast, uh, became uh, just a jungle of fungus and mold. Uh, everything had to be evacuated. Everyone, all, the entire work at the IRS headquarters, this is like six floors, an entire block of the building, to different parts of the metro area for 18 months, including all of our work, all of the computer servers and the data, much of it was lost. Uh, work had to continue. By the way, none of this, this occurrence was not on our risk register as a possible occurrence for which resources were set aside. And I'm telling you, for 18 months, uh, the entire downtown operation of the IRS was distributed across the Washington metro area. It was not foreseen. Now, what's the problem with all of this? Well, first of all, Computing probability is not generally understood uh, by people outside of, let's say, um, insurance uh, actuarial work and a few other areas. Also, extremely unlikely events are assumed in practical terms to be effectively impossible and therefore ignored. And yet, I've just given you some anecdotes um, that many of you in your own mind are going, yeah, stuff like that me all the time. Maybe not every day, but maybe once or every year or two. Okay, last year. Last year there were um, there was a great deal of flooding in the northeastern United States. Um, the uh, the nature of the flood was called of uh, both of the floods called the hundred year flood. Now there's a that there's a technical definition for that. A 100-year flood is, and I looked this up, here it is, is the level of flood water.